Hello, good afternoon. I'm Chase Strong. I am the Director of Data Science and Machine Learning at Eagleview. Um, just as a little aside, Eagleview is a, a mid-sized company in the Seattle area that does a lot of high-resolution aerial capture. And I lead the team that does all of the geospatial uh, feature extraction at scale. But this talk is not going to be about any of that. Um, I got into data science, uh, and specifically geospatial data science, uh, a little bit as an accident about five years ago now. Um, and my kind of my first jump into that was largely being exposed to OSM, both you know eventually collaborating, like working up the courage to collaborate largely on hot tasks and things, but then also learning to leverage that data for you know using what we've been talking about in terms of supervising machine learning models, um, just understanding the wealth of geospatial data there. Um, but this particular talk is really uh, more focused on, on my love of education and taking what I've learned from um, being in a machine learning based startup, the geospatial element contributing to OSM, and turning that into um, some uh, smaller scale curriculum at University of Washington. And then you know, kind of working that into a broader theme of uh, teaching students uh, largely, uh, you know, how to create these models, what they're good for, what they're not good for. Um, and then, you know, this, this broader aspect of what does it take to democratize a lot of machine learning model development. Uh, so a lot of different themes there. Um, so I'm just going to dig right in. You're also in for a treat because my five-year-old approved of the design composition of this template. So there's a lot of really valuable colors in here. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm going to be using machine learning a lot, uh, you know, as an acronym, um, ML, but, but really I'm talking about these convolutional neural networks that are really excellent at scaling uh, visual pattern extraction um, that we've seen some examples of with the building footprints and, and transportation networks. Um, and then, of course, you know, because largely, you know, the types of geospatial uh, data in the world that we live in, it's really the supervision of these models with the examples that we can create a really robust training data set and, and really extract the features that we're interested in. And part of that then, of course, can be leveraged from the, the OpenStreetMap um, community. But there's a piece of that is, is still, of course, there's curation. There's, you know, as a data scientist, you can't just download, you know, gigabytes worth of data from OpenStreetMap and just assume that it's all going to be unified and can be adopted for, for model usage. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, data curation that goes on there. Um, but then again, you know, going back to how can I uh, create knowledge base uh, within, you know, up and coming geospatial analysts, uh, you know, around what it takes to create these models and, and what, what that whole ecosystem looks like. Um, and then ultimately, like, could we create some type of open source, uh, open geo ML model marketplace? And a little bit more on that later. These are just examples of uh, machine learning derivative products that I've either worked at at Eagleview or I've done as part of my work with UW. You know, the top is, is all those little red boxes or the buildings. Um, I think this is Atlanta region. On the kind of the bottom left, my left hand side, is uh, uh, different types of um, uh, power lines and, and um, uh, electrical poles. And then uh, the kind of land classification map, this colorized inset map where you see a lot of the grays, that is kind of impervious surface mapping along with vegetation, different types of vegetation, um, pools you can see in that bright blue. And at the very bottom, this is a, a, a predictive analysis that utilized a lot of different geospatial information to, to try to assess um, the likelihood of, of water wells, wells fell, failing in Uganda. So just different examples of kind of machine learning applications there. And that's what I wanted to bring as part of my educational workshops with UW. So it's kind of a, another little pla uh, uh, soapbox <laughs> aside here, um, at least in the world of, of machine learning and, and partly in geospatial machine learning applications, there's a huge um, kind of push towards platform adoption. A lot of big players um, and even small players, startups are really trying to create these platforms kind of all in one where you bring your data or you leverage their data and you can you know, maybe create a model, but then it lives in this very tightly bound ecosystem. And I find as a data scientist, that's really not what I'm interested in. Um, I think it, again, stems back from my desire to be open source and collaborative, um, but also I want to know, I want to get into the nuts and bolts and not have somebody dictate to me how to manage my models and my infrastructure. But at the same time, it's a challenge as a data scientist to understand, you know, how am I going to make this work without the right cloud orchestration um, elements and the right labor? And then, you know, always that 
the proof of concept is easy. You know, machine learning models are not that hard anymore. The barrier to entry to actually running these models is, is pretty minimal. Um, but it's the scaling that's really complicated. You know, whether we saw previously that, you know, going across different regional um, areas or, or whatever the case may be. So that's the challenge. Um, and then kind of going back to the university side, I do find that there's you know, a lot of these uh, larger corporations or, or larger companies that um, have invested a lot in their platform development are also, they tend to be the big spenders in some of the university programs in terms of providing their tool sets for, for educational uses. Um, and then this, this last piece, which is still, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to get to, but uh, you know, we're starting to see a rise of model marketplaces. You know, there's the AWS model marketplace, there's a couple of others. Um, but again, really with this lean on, you know, you pay for use. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential there, kind of in more of an open um, source aspect. So my little puzzle piece here, like, again, bringing all these pieces together, all of my difficulties and my struggles as a data scientist, but um, helping uh, UW with, you know, providing exposure, some cloud experience, you know, help <coughs> enhance the learning curve or, or expedite it, I guess, and maybe diminish a little bit of that, that control by the big players. Um, so what is UW, uh, the GeoHack Week in particular that I, I might have alluded to previously? Uh, this is a week-long uh, annual event that happens. It's actually, we're, this year it starts Monday. Um, so this is hot off the press for you that I'm sharing with you today, what I'm doing. But um, I was only recently involved in this. I, I moved to Seattle from Washington, D.C. last year and got pretty quickly involved in it, um, largely just out of curiosity, wanting to volunteer. And as soon as I started talking to some of the professors that were um, creating the content for this, they were like, yes, please come talk about machine learning. Um, and so they, their kind of approach in 2018 was this software carpentry approach, which I was not super familiar with. Um, it's a lot of IPython notebooks, which I think is great, uh, but it's, it's a little bit, um, I think, harder to use in some of the geospatial applications. And so this year, I had really proposed to, to try to do a very seamless uh, week-long event where rather than having this, this software carpentry approach where each day uh, students might take bits and pieces about like what is vector data sets, what are raster data sets, maybe a little bit about machine learning, and let's create this one week-long project that essentially students come in on Monday morning, uh, they start contributing immediately to OSM in terms of creating vector data and interacting with that type of platform, understand what that data is, and then over the course of the week, understand uh, progressively more complicated elements to then ultimately train a machine learning model with uh, the information that they had then checked in on Monday. And this is, uh, I think, again, totally experimental this coming week. Uh, the challenge, of course, too, is that the students that attend, it's about 50 students that are accepted. It's open globally. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a wide range. So there's undergrads, graduate students, there's working professionals that are all coming to this GeoHack Week to try to enhance their tool set around geospatial capabilities. And so it's a really interesting dynamic, but it can be a challenge to kind of teach to. But, Everything that's generated is all open source, and um, I, I think there's a lot of potential here to do something really interesting. Um, just a little bit more specifically on the element that I have helped um, co-create this year, uh, again, is this you know, leveraging OSM um, to create these machine learning models and, and you know, provide more insight into what being a geospatial data scientist is. And the thing that I'm really proud of is, you know, these 50 new students are going to become, on day one, OSM mappers. And we're actually bringing in um, a volunteer from the Missing Maps program in Seattle uh, to help uh, actually provide a lot of background and, and get the students up and running. And then I was able to negotiate with AWS for some free cloud compute um, using Amazon SageMaker, which uh, will uh, kind of help bridge the gap a little bit on model creation. Uh, so that I'm pretty excited about, but also slightly nervous um, to see how it, how it goes over. But then my unaffiliated personal goal is just to kind of advance some of the potential stagnant geospatial activities and create, you know, a community of, of uh, students, but also, you know, advanced researchers that are really interested in moving a lot of this forward. So kind of tapping on all four of those little puzzle pieces there. <clears throat> and this is my nice little infographic of what I consider GeoML to be, to me. So, you know, there's these three core components and our curriculum is developed around these. Uh, kind of a mixture of different various libraries and open source, but then also just 
themes that, that are um, recurring. So, you know, on the raster data side, for students, these, these are the pixels, right? Um, but where do those come from? And, you know, there's a lot of GDAL usage and, and slippy map definitions, uh, georectification issues, getting kind of all that content in one day, but, but giving the students some exposure to that. Um, and then, you know, of course, raster plus vector. So the vector is going to be all of the label data that we're going to use for supervision. Um, and we're going to get that from OSM, but we're also going to contribute back through um, various means that way as well. But getting them used to understanding, you know, GeoPandas and OSM and X and over to over and all of these things that I have, have used a lot over the last five years. But again, building this, this um, tool set that ultimately leads to the machine learning endeavor. Right, so I think GeoML is just a really interesting space to apply machine learning to in general. There's this very visceral, visually quantifiable element to it where you can't hide behind the model, per se. It's going to always be confirmed by a human, potentially, or looked up on a map. And so I think you know, having these tool sets and, and educating the students on how to integrate all these things is really important. But again, kind of on the ML side, you know, learning what it takes to fuse the raster and vector data sets to create supervised uh, data uh, for training is really important. And then, you know, I'm, I'm you know, uh, at Eagle View work predominantly in AWS with Apache MXNet, so I, I kind of am leaning towards a lot of that as, as part of the tutorial, but just again exposing the students to, to applied levels of machine learning and not necessarily the theoretical elements. And I think I, I also like to go through with them a bit on this whole data curation side and what it takes, you know, as you're downloading the data and the information, what it takes to actually establish a, a good training data set. Um, do not need to read these, but these are all available open source uh, on my GitHub account under the Sagely project. But basically the, the, the lecture component to what I give is a, it's a two hour long interactive workshop element, just getting them to spin up two different independent IPython notebooks. Um, we're focusing on this Cyclone Kenneth event uh, that was uh, you know, uh, in one of the, the major tasks in HOT back in April. And uh, you know, part of that is being able to uh, pull down the data, pull down all the polygons and all the, the labels and that kind of information, and just within one single notebook, create the, the label data needed for um, training the model. And then, the kind of following up and compartmentalizing the whole training data set with the model uh, side is a much shorter Python notebook that is actually, you know, take what you just created um, and interact with AWS S3 and, and these EC2 instances just notionally and train your own model and create an endpoint um, API that you can then hit with an additional data set and just look and see how you did. And a little bit, you know, right now is uh, it's still time overhead in terms of training a model, especially given the limited amount of time I have. So it's a, kind of the, the cooking show, like I kind of have data set aside and I have a model and they can hit it. But then just giving them the time to work through the various notebooks is I think a really gonna be an important part of this. Um, this is kind of an example of, of unrelated output only because we haven't had the event yet. But this is where, in particular, there's, you'll see as we kind of zoom in, this was hurricane, uh, a hurricane a couple years ago that hit Rockport in Texas pretty hard. Um, and the red boxes are all damaged buildings, and the blue, little blue boxes are tarps actually on top of roofs. And this, you know, I took a lot of the label data for the buildings themselves off of OSM, and then had to go through a significant amount of curation to assess um, based on uh, digital globe imagery what was damaged and what wasn't damaged. And then it could scale that up with SageMaker. So it kind of is this really nice end-to-end -end little project. And this is essentially what the outcome of, is uh, for the students as well. And so just my last slide, you know, I, where I want to see this go, of course, we'll see how it goes this next week. But you know, what does it look like to create more of an open marketplace and how do you bring people and how do you incentivize people to contribute? Um, and that's something I'm really interested in pursuing and I'm not quite sure how that's gonna play out. But just to give you an example of like more of the commercial marketplaces, uh, you know, obviously this is not a new idea. There is one on AWS. I personally, as a data scientist, would never buy a model here. Um, I think that's just, it's not necessarily tailored to what I need, but I think from, I would love to see, you know, from an academic perspective, models made available that were just from papers, for instance. 
And then you have companies like Algorithmia who also provide um, you know, the ability to use uh, free of charge some of their core models. But again, it kind of you know, bridges or puts you into this box of having to utilize their platform and their ecosystem in order to really leverage that information. So you know, kind of taking an abstraction from that and create something that's a little bit more um, uh, Lego block oriented, but that students and other practitioners like could, could contribute to, I think has a lot of value. So that's all I have. So I think I'm a little early, but thank you. Uh, thank you for that talk. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit more on the bullet under the, the first bullet, extricate the free models from their marriage? You just mean a, a black box model, like if you just rent it on AWS or whatever, you're just, are you asking like if they would give the, so you would understand how the model's working better or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like, uh free the model from the platform kind of a thing. And so I think, you know, what I'm seeing, and maybe not necessarily the case with some of the AWS models where maybe you're spinning up a, an AMI that has that model there and you can build an infrastructure around it, but more kind of the, the platform-centric models, um, which is not, I'm not trying to, you know, create a bad stigma associated with that, but, um, but that you're, there's kind of this bring your data to my model and my platform, and I will take your data and I will alleviate all of your concerns and you don't need to worry about it. And I think there's a lot of uh, like interest in that because that is the hard part, but that because it's the hard part, it's the important part. And so I think just in, you know, understanding a little bit more about how the model might be orchestrated or integrated with your data, or if you have some control over the types of resources that, the compute resources that you're using. Like, so that there's, a, there's kind of a black box around some of that that I think is smart for certain startups to try to alleviate, but, but I think it, it maybe is trying too hard to simplify the problem and not providing data scientists the opportunity to kind of go in there and, and get a little bit more dirty. Um, so that's, that's kind of the intention there, but yeah. I'm just curious, uh, how much fair computing support did you get from AWS? Oh, oh, so they, uh, how much support, monetary support? Yeah, they've agreed, <laughs> so the numbers haven't exactly changed hands, but they've agreed to cover uh, a couple thousand dollars worth of compute cost, so. Yeah, and I, I felt, um, so I pulled a couple strings, you know, our, our company EagleView, um, is owned by a private equity firm, and we have some nice relationships with AWS where they, you know, we spend, we spend a lot of money on the cloud. We have a huge amount of imagery, petabytes of imagery we're processing, and so I felt like, you know, I could try to pull a couple strings and a couple K. <laughs> and <clears throat> I think we're good. All right, if Thank we you. don't have final questions.